welcome back to Massalia Tales. In the previous episode, we started our war with the Nervii. They had fortified an army inside our lands. But when Benders went in to make an attack, they even came slowly out of the fort and allowed us to destroy them. They then, though, had another army heading in, into our territory. Luckily, the crossing point into our lands was defended by Acronius. He had loads of pikes and javelins, locking the enemy in place in the river and then destroying them, even hitting them with a rear attack after crossing the river at a different point. But then a new war started when Hyas Dan suddenly attacked our client state, Trapezos. We were forced to join this war against the large Armenian Empire and immediately we saw action because they had forces guarding our territory, which turned on us. Luckily, although they had an advantage in this first battle, we used our phalanx to block the narrow Greek city streets and surround the enemy, eventually destroying them in their first attack. They had more armies though, and one of them besieged Seleucia, our capital in Mesopotamia, which Cretheus now goes to relieve. The Nervii leaders had a feeling of strength after their successful conquests of Germania. But all it really proved was that they were powerful in comparison to the many scattered tribes of the region. Against Massalia, an entirely different metric needed to be used. Were they able to outsupply a republic with bases all over the world? Were they able to field warriors superior to men who had trained daily for years as professional soldiers? Few had considered the consequences of a war against the South, seeing only borders to raid and not the looming storm that lay beyond. For the Massalians' part, they had correctly assumed that only a small portion of their strength need be committed to the war, and that any losses taken would be temporary. We're planning our next move in the war against Nervii, where we have two armies on the southern and western borders of Cassurgius ready to move in. We recently defeated the force near Uberzis, the Nervii force, and they don't have much around as far as we know, so I'm thinking we'll just move in and see what we can do against this settlement. I do already know, however, that there is actually a stack in there because I saw it move in in the last turn, but Bendis doesn't care much. He's going to go and see how the balance of power looks. The enemy army is pretty strong, and it's... Uh, uh, got a massive advantage over us in theory there, but I thought actually I could bring Acronius up to support, but unfortunately he can't actually reach Bendis where he is there. So we're not going to be able to do this this turn. What I can do is move up and discover the survivors of Acronius' previous battle against the Nervii. So we're going to move in and take them out. That's denying the Nervii. Yet another general, this guy only a lower level person, but soon they'll be down to a bunch of level 1 guys. So this is still helping out and of course we defeated a few military units as well. So, we can't move up to support Bendis now, so because of this, Bendis is actually just going to break off the siege because we might as well just wait until next turn and then do the same thing with Acronius. There's no particular rush to take this settlement right here. So he's going to just move slightly away to make sure he's not in range of the garrison in case that army comes out for a field battle and now wait. Now I thought it would be useful to have a quick look at the uh, disposition of Hyastan our new enemy, just so everyone knows where the empire is. You can see it's a big ring of an empire stretching out through their new conquest from Trapezos coming into Asia there. They've also got a defensive alliance here with the Egyptians who control a major stake in the area. So if they worked together, they would be totally dominating. Now I'm going to look now to Sparta. I noticed they weren't really diplomatically aligned Athena with highest dance. So I thought I might be able to so get them to actually well join this war. Their position call. doesn't make it ideal, but they've already helped quite a lot in my war against the Katyuroi. So they've proven they're willing to make expeditions in order to help their allies, but they weren't willing to come in. I also attempted to get my client state Athens in on the action who are still just sitting there in Pergamon after their famous defeat many years ago now, but they wouldn't have it. We did learn though at the start of the next turn that Hyastan has now broken their relations with Bactria, the faction over to the east right on the edge of the map, so we might be able to use that. Unfortunately a Nervii stack has appeared and besieged Vesontio from the north there. We don't have any armies nearby so I can't really send a relief force, I'm going to basically just let them besiege it. We also learned that Trapezos has been defeated, our former client state who drew us into the war with Hyastan has now been wiped out, although that was expected because they were very very weak. But the good news at least is that we're now ready to make our attack on Cassurgis. The Nervii didn't leave the settlement nor did they come out to attack me while I was divided so I'm free to make this move. The balance bar has actually barely changed despite adding in a whole stack of heavy troops but I don't have much faith in that balance bar. I think I really do have the advantage so I'm going to prepare siege equipment for an attack. 
I try to get Bactria now to join in on the war with Higher Stan, trying to exploit that their relationship seems to be declining, but uh, they're not going to go in for it. It seems no one wants to attack Higher Stan, and that makes sense because they're very powerful, even though I'm able to give massive sums of money in return. Now, I thought Higher Stan would attack Seleucia with that stack in the previous turn. They definitely have the siege equipment already because they've been there for two turns now, but the fact that they didn't means I can do this, and they don't run away from this, so they're in huge trouble. Kreathus' army is stronger than the enemy's on its own and we've got a full stack coming out as the garrison as well so we totally overwhelm that force and destroy it two massive mistakes from that highest down main force there meaning we enslave a whole bunch of their army kill the rest and are now free to move we can move into their territory now there's an undefended walled settlement up there there's a smaller settlement to the south of it which i think is probably undefended as well so Hayastan really done poorly in the opening of this war. Neither side really expected the war to happen, but we've definitely gained the upper hand and the initiative at the start of the conflict. Now as we move on, we see the Nervii conquer one of the Illy Illyrian Confederation settlements in the east, and then immediately after that, they sally out here at Kasurgis. Balance bar still in the enemy's favour, but the enemy army is basically all heavy infantry. We have a massive cavalry and ranged advantage, and I know that in the battle, we'll be able to use those two advantages to really hammer the enemy. Also, their leading stack of the garrison army is nothing. They'll be annihilated even in a straight infantry combat, so I'm expecting this to be easy. He said we're going to stand, ready the men. His scouts say most of the enemy are simply the townspeople we besiege, and so their number will help them little. On that note, he insists we pour everything into destroying any militia from the town we see. Not only will they be weak, Lord Bendis claims, but their loss will impact the zeal of their more hardened warriors, seeing that their efforts to defend these people have failed. One is drawn to think rather of the opposite approach, to kill the true warriors, to prompt the common people to surrender, but that is not the way of Lord Bendis, I am sure, and we are here to support his strategy. So do what you must, and do not trouble yourself to think of the reasons behind it. Here is the Massalian double stack, ready to do battle. We're not going to spend too much time on this battle because of our massive tactical advantage. You'll see we quite easily overcome the enemy soon enough. We've got a big right echelon with all of Acronius's legionaries, and then the right side of the main line is all of his pikes. In front of the whole main line, we've got Peltus and Archers to act as skirmishers. As we go along, the pikes switch over to a regular hoplites, the ones brought in by Bendis. And right at the end of the line, we have Bendis's swordsmen, currently in hiding here so the enemy might be slightly surprised by that and of course cavalry out going out onto the far edges of the battlefield ready to come back around to the enemy's rear so the enemy make the advance that i expected running into my pike wall with their armed citizenry and just being cut down they're gonna have javelins and arrows showering upon these units with low defenses they're gonna die really fast and they're still trying to make impossible attacks terrible moves from the ai they're still coming in with units all along the line as well and they'll lose each and every one of those fights even without arrows and javelins raining down upon them they didn't wait for their reinforcements at all as you can see their second army still far behind meaning all of their slingers and missile units at the back who are going to be firing at me will be totally exposed. I can fold around with my legionaries to just crush the first army before the second arrives and of course my many cavalry units will rush forwards into the back of the enemy's formation to destroy these slingers. These guys are really low in morale. You can see they take a couple of losses, a rear attack, and that shatters them. They shatter with basically their entire strength left just because of the rear attack. So we can just do that to all of their units really quickly. I then try a rear attack on the enemy's main position, but enemy units already routing, actually blocking my ability to attack the ones already in there. Hashtag Massalian might problems. They even had some chariots in there who were quickly defeated against the Hoplite line, so all going absolutely fine. The first army was wiped out. Here comes the second army, more powerful this time, doing the same strategy but with better units. Here, their first attack isn't very good at some light spears with no armor who will die against the Hoplite phalanx. Then in come the Berserkers, a really deadly rain of javelins precedes their attack, but they actually come out of wedge at the last second and then make a very tired, unenthusiastic looking march into the lines. 
So Berserkers are better than Hoplites, but they're exhausted from charging all the way across the map. And my Hoplites have gold experience, so in this particular situation, we are going to be fine in that combat. So the enemy are going to commit all along the line with all of their units. Some of my line will not be used, so I'll be able to fold around all over the place. Here you can see the Legionaries rushing forward, cutting down these enemy Berserkers as they make their advance. And I'll have plenty of Legionaries to totally surround and gradually destroy those Berserkers. Here, some light Javelinmen, no armor. They are technically a spear unit, but they have no chance against our overwhelming cavalry advantage. We just run them down. And so with the back of the enemy's line secured, we begin the charges into the rear of the enemy's heavy infantry. Unlike the first army, this army is more disciplined, more powerful, so just making a charge into the rear isn't enough to rout them and get them out of the fight. If we want to win there, we'll need to use cycle charges. I'm also coming in to exploit my advantage with legionaries to come in and fight at close order right after the cavalry leave here again. Another cavalry charge, one of my men <laughs> charging right through into my own ranks there. Not sure he knows what's going on. But anyway... Here you can see the Kelto-Hellenic Hoplite is coming into battle, the uh, slightly confusingly named unit. They're actually a heavy sword unit, very similar to Thorax Swordsman, with a slight Celtic twist in terms of their equipment themes. Overall, a powerful unit, easily able to rout these units it's fighting, and at this point there is a chain route across the whole field. We didn't even have to kill that many of the enemy to make them rout, because with their first army already lost, they were already on shaky ground. So, bish bash bosh, that's a heroic victory. That was quite easy, totally defying the balance bar there. You can see from the results, we killed uh, more than 10 times as many as we lost. Absolutely perfect result from the combined forces of Bendis and Acronius. The enemy so damaged that the settlement is pretty much doomed to be ours in the next turn because we can just auto-resolve our way in there. So here in the next turn, it's uh, reminding me I've got a high civil war chance again. I think it's going to keep doing that. Ben just levels up and we're going to make him uh, very high level in conscription so that his army will replenish super fast whenever it takes losses. We're now going to storm into the settlement. Basically nothing in there. The balance bar now quite the opposite to what it was just a minute ago when we fought them. So that army is cut down and will take the settlement. Bendis moving in to make his first capture in the war against the Nervii and a decent capture as well. A region capital, a walled settlement. So we move in and it is now ours. This region is actually part of a region we share with our client state, the score Dissi. So that's going to be useful in that there's no threats coming from the east anymore. We can focus on the northern advance where the Nervii still have plenty of settlements and indeed armies. Unfortunately, the settlement is food negative, so I can't tax it because it would cause a famine across my entire republic, so I'm not going to do that, and I'll start converting the settlement over to Hellenic ways. Now, we have the enemy besieging Vesontio, and I thought, if they take it, we need to go and get it back. And I thought, Acronius might as well go and deal with this. He can move over to Aberzis now, on the way, hopefully defeat that raiding army. And then, if Vesontio falls, he can continue on into the next province and try and defeat that army and take it back. So, we've got our little insurance policy going there. Plus, of course, we still have a cheeky army from Eustachus, which is going to sail right up to the Nervii capital and land troops there, just to really hammer home our advantage in a couple of turns' time. Now, for Cretheus over in Mesopotamia, I noticed he was taking attrition. It seems there's a drought in Mesopotamia, which is causing attrition across all of our garrisons and any armies in the province, and uh, causing a number of other problems as well. But, luckily for me, I can just walk into Hyastan's territory where there isn't a drought and that problem is left behind. So, that was perfect. Almost a, a good excuse to make an attack against this settlement. It has no army in it, but it does have a 20-unit garrison. Pretty much one of the most powerful settlements we're going to see. But that's not going to put me off. We're going to go in. They have a giant advantage, of course. Their army is pretty decent. It's got upgrades, lots of archers, but it has lots of uh, trashy spear units as well that will be easily defeated by my army. So I'm not too worried about it. Plus, they only have two turns of supplies. So I'm going to build a siege tower and just siege them out right now. We can very easily break them down by attrition. Now we're going to jump back over to the Daemons of Polymers. I was moving them east, thinking I'll go and attack Hyastan's territory on the northern part of the map. But actually, I thought, you know what, while I'm here, I might just try and take the Sakuraka capital, because clearly Archibosphorus are not going to take it. We spent so long trying to get Archibosphorus to be successful, and they're just not hammering home the final blow, so we're going to do it for them. I can go in, and if I can win the battle, I can basically sack the settlement and just have it be so weak that I'm sure 
Okay, boss, first we're going to take it, or, of course, take it for ourselves at this stage. So I'm going to build out some siege equipment. The enemy army inside is really powerful. It's actually the perfect counter to the Daemons of Polymus. It's basically all uh, horse archers and foot archers, loads of them with upgrades as well. So it's kind of in our advantage to try and siege them out if we can. We can help ourselves doing that by besieging the port, blockading the port with Evios and his fleet, who will also take part in the battle if there is a fight over the city. We still, though, have a big disadvantage unless Archebosphorus moves in a little closer. But before any of that, we have a different siege to worry about. Vasodio comes under attack by the Novia army that was besieging it. It's been there for a couple of turns, so we know it's going to have lots of siege equipment. We've already lost a third of our men to attrition unfortunately and the enemy army is led by a really high level commander that's going to be buffing all of those troops lots of heavy troops lots of archers who can hide anywhere only a few cavalry but of course not so important for a siege battle so let's do our best and try and hold these walls why do you care so much about the stone wall walls mean only two things that the town is rich and scared they know they can beat us so they hope we'll just go away when we see a wall in our path. The Massarians think we are dumb, you see. And with luck, they'll keep thinking that until the doors of the siege tower smash their ramparts and a hundred bloodthirsty men go hunting for blood and gold. <laughs> Make no mistake, friend. The men at the front carrying the ladders and storming the walls are not the fools here. They are the ones who will get the riches. May the gods have pity on men like us and left in reserve, for it'll be only scraps of glory or silver left by the time we arrive. So the garrison at Vasontio prepares to hold the city. The city is very good in terms of choke points, actually, because the capture point, the victory point, is in this center of a walled off part of the city with this huge statue overlooking it. So you can see I've put a reserve, including my general, at the back there as a little backstop in case the walls fall. On the walls, though, that's where the majority of the men will fight. We've got archers facing off against the enemy's advance with Hoplites also up there to defend against men coming up on the enemy's many ladders, which you can see are going to swarm the front of the wall around the gatehouse. I put two units of citizen cav outside the city to start with in case they get a chance to harass the enemy as they approach. So now it's just up to the enemy to push their ladders into range and we'll start hitting them with fire arrows. As we've seen before in siege battles, you unfortunately can't actually target siege pieces with fire arrows. You have to target the unit pushing it. So it's actually by accident that the siege piece gets hit. But uh, enough hits will uh, come in from the fire arrows, especially at long range, that we will be able to do fire damage to them. You can see the gates were actually left open after the cavalry left. I'm not sure why they don't close, but the enemy doesn't notice this. And don't exploit it so that's all fine you can also see my archers aren't actually doing anything in most cases they're well within range and have already fired a volley but they decided to wait quite a long time before firing the next volley eventually they get their act together and start firing from the arc of their shots you can tell they're deliberately trying to miss the ladders in order to get the arrows over the top to hit the crew behind which is a massive shame if they actually just fired fully into the ladders i think we would actually get most of them before they hit the walls we'd definitely get i'd say half of these ladders before they set up flaming but unfortunately even with loads of archers like we have we're only going to get a couple of these ladders down before they arrive which of course is a huge problem because the enemy have a big melee advantage one of the units was distracted off by my cavalry so i decided to react with a cavalry charge that actually didn't do very much the enemy's counter javelins inflicted casualties on our unit and then the hit didn't do all that much these enemy heavy infantry aren't really uh, weak enough to be affected by garrison cav charges and now they're starting their main attack leading with these berserkers coming up the first ladder berserkers very high stats they are going to be quite good against my hoplites who are standing ready to defend against them you can see the second the berserkers hit the wall they start pushing those hoplites back and taking control of this space the Hoplites will die slowly, that's the only advantage I have on my side, but they will certainly lose and they will barely kill any of these Berserkers, their stats are too far superior. So, unfortunately, the only way to overcome that will be to push in lots of numbers, and to do that we need to free up other parts of the wall. This ladder here, which has been set up against the wall, uh, wasn't being used by the enemy, which was convenient, because my archers trying to fire at the enemy below were accidentally hitting the ladder with fire arrows, and that causes it to catch fire, which is great. So everywhere on that side of the gatehouse isn't going to be attacked in the assault, which frees up a couple of units to move around. 
Here on the other side of the gatehouse, it's the complete opposite, with most of the enemy's ladders getting into position, so there's going to be a massive assault there. They have their siege towers coming in too, but uh, siege towers aren't actually as good as ladders in this situation, because the archers can target the unit inside the siege tower, and thus will actually hit it with most of their shots. So it only takes a couple of volleys to get these things on fire. Here you can see the crew scrambling to escape the first tower as its damage increases. So that's going to slightly lessen the load on this part of the wall, but uh, maybe that's not really going to make a difference because as you can see they've already taken a massive amount of control of the wall. The hoplites up there are going to get surrounded very fast and not going to be able to use the hoplite phalanx. Here where the berserkers are pushing against my men they've almost totally taken control of their little landing area so nothing good. The second siege tower unfortunately did make it to the wall. It almost caught fire but once it's actually at the wall you uh, once again cannot target it with your men so it's going to sit there spilling out enemy troops Sometimes the guard towers will shoot the uh, siege towers down, but in this case it wasn't targeting them. And my archers are having trouble getting out of melee. They tend to get drawn into melee if the enemy deploy close. You can even see the enemy have deployed troops into the city now, just rushing straight off the wall to move further in, so they're not wasting any time. More and more troops streaming in. You see them just popping out of the smoke from the siege tower and diving into the wall, where a lot of the times they're fighting archers or militia hoplites. They'll definitely win, of course, there. And the more professional troops are totally surrounded or are being slaughtered as in the case of this hopper unit one of the first hopper units to enter combat is now being annihilated by the berserkers who've taken total control of the wall and all of the units around them will now be able to stream to other parts of the wall to support their comrades of course I did have troops on the other side of the gatehouse the ones that were freed up by me destroying those ladders earlier so they could come into the fight but they're not going to make a huge difference you can see I'm actually trying to get them to leave the wall and rush back towards that victory point further back in the city but unfortunately it just doesn't work like that you can see they start leaving they come down the wall and then uh, suddenly change direction and go you know what I'm gonna go back up the wall because some of their units still in combat and they prioritize going into combat over moving so everyone keeps getting pushed back into this slaughter all of our men are going to be lost but if we fall back to the temple what will happen to the city we're the only thing between the Germans and our people anyone who goes back is leaving their family to the mercy of bloodthirsty monsters so to Hades with the commanders runners if they send any more just take their weapons and throw them over the wall we take arms to defend our homes and loved ones not the pride of some nobleman back up Everyone back up. Do not suffer an enemy to set foot on our ground. Take your place in the phalanx and fight not just for your own life, but for the life of our city. The enemy are tired and not used to our ways, amazed already by the defences we have shown them. Now let's complete their rout with a show of spirit. Up and at them! So although things aren't going all that well on the wall, I can still make a difference in front of it by sending out those cav who I already exfiltrated to go and attack the enemy's archers who were just hanging around out there. Now the enemy had cav of their own, but I wasn't worried about them because they were only light and medium cav. This proved to be a little bit of an underestimation of their power. You can see they instantly come in and surround my cavalry. My guys are a heavy cavalry unit that can theoretically beat them, but they're just sort of swarmed right now and being attacked from all sides, so their morale isn't going to hold and they're not going to get a chance to actually fight against the enemy's weaker units. You can see I'm trying to save my first unit with the second unit there that was dealing with some enemy archers one-on-one, -on -one, but it's not going to happen. My unit routes quickly. My attack does kill some of the enemy's cavalry, but it's not going to actually win because the enemy have all the archers out of the fight now who can turn and bombard the melee with showers of arrows, killing both sides, which is a handy, but it's going to kill me faster. So my heavy cavalry attack has pretty much failed and both of those units were lost. Meanwhile, on the wall, as you can see, it's just a massive mess, basically. Almost all the units you can see are the enemies. A few of mine still fighting on. It's really just these hoplites on the end who've managed to use the uh, guardhouse to slightly give themselves a choke point who are not being totally killed. Everyone else just getting wiped out. I've got a couple of units you can see on the left there that did eventually manage to escape the melee by running along the wall. And they're going to try and run back to our choke point, but will they arrive in time? Because the enemy are already coming up to attack it. They're capturing the point in the plaza just beneath 
underneath my uh, little choke point up there. We've also got some arrow fire coming down. This is a couple of the archers, but we did manage to actually get out of the melee on the other side with enemy siege towers where I think I had two units there and one unit did manage to escape. So they're going to have a very important vantage over the enemy's approach as they come towards the phalanx I'm going to set up here with all of the heavy infantry I can muster. It's the reserve and a few units that managed to escape the slaughter on the walls. So here's the first enemy unit coming up to my choke point. It's going to be attacked by the tower as well as my archers. I would have two towers here, but the other one's destroyed for some reason. I've also got another unit of archers that escaped uh, from the side of the wall that wasn't really attacked, which is now able to sneak around and hit the enemy with some cheeky trick shots, <laughs> fire arrows, shot backwards. The enemy seemed to be tempted into a melee by that, but then they decided to have second thoughts and go right in against the phalanx, which is of course what I want. So the enemy probably have an advantage in terms of stats, but uh, we have our flanks totally defended by these giant towers, and we have lots of reserves in the choke point ready to cycle in and out. So. We should be able to hold for a long time. Meanwhile, we've still got one unit of Hoplites alive on the wall fighting against the enemy's berserkers using that guardhouse, as I mentioned, to stop the enemy going around to their flanks. But unfortunately, even a frontal engagement berserkers will win that, so they'll be going down soon. Now, more of the enemy's army coming in to fight against our line. You can see I've actually got my weaker unit at the front. The plan being to have them to fight as long as possible to make sure all of the enemy are exhausted before my more effective troops go in. The enemy attacked all up one side of the two sets of staircases leading to my choke point, which meant the archers sitting on the other set of stairs can cheekily fire arrows into the back of the enemy, reducing the chance of them blocking things with their shield, which is handy. Plus, I have a unit of hoplites sneaking up these stairs. Now, I wanted to make some kind of decisive rear attack, but it didn't really work out just because they couldn't get the formation I wanted. They ended up just uh, tapping one of the flanks of the enemy's units, and then the enemy turned units out of their big blob to come and fight me in the front. So. All I've really done there is open up a new battlefront, which is going to do something that's a decent unit that might actually kill some enemies in there, but it's going to be very vulnerable to being surrounded itself because it's not big enough to protect its own flanks. And indeed, the rest of the enemy's army pretty soon came up. I got my archers out of the way as they came up those stairs that I was using, and the hoplites abandoned their combat and pushed their way through the militia to just get completely out of the way. You can see the archers do the opposite for some reason. They decide to run out and fight with their daggers. This because the archers tend to glitch out when you leave them on skirmish mode. They sometimes run toward the enemy rather than away, so I have to force them back into our little plaza behind the wall of shields there. So, with them getting out of the way, the fight is now descending into a slug match. The enemy is piling everything into my main position, and I'm going to try and fight them. Interestingly, they're sending their general and cav in, who uh, actually gets good penetration on the militia, almost getting all the way through them. Their general is the one with the red plume on his helmet at the front, there, so actually vulnerable to being killed himself, but he's really, really high level, which I think means that a lot of his guards have to die before he's allowed to be killed in the game's little rules. So he basically fights on absolutely fine right at the front, even here because he's totally surrounded by my troops who are just unable to kill him, even with their bonus against cavalry and their own hoplite phalanx formation technically. So absolutely useless, <laughs> these men proved to be at taking down the enemy's general. So he is going to fight on, probably killing a whole bunch of my men. Overall, this fight is just a huge grind, us versus them. We we have energy and positioning on our side, the enemy have numbers and sheer man-for-man -man strength. We'll see who wins next time. In the two wars, fought on front so distant that neither was aware of the war on the other, Massalia was getting the same result. The Nervii and Hyastan both had initiative in their wars, the chance to make the first attack after learning that Massalia would not betray its bonds to its allies. They had both struck into Massalian lands with previously successful armies and they had both hit the steel wall of the professional Hellenistic field armies, impossible to overcome using the straightforward tactics of both the Nervii and Hyastan generals. Both were thus put on the defensive, and would find as much success there as they did in attack, for the Massalians had long planned for the conquest of their lands, and knew they could not be stopped.